Yo, yo, my sovereigns, what up? This is Boba Fett. Boba Fett, Boba Fett, Boba Fett. Uncensored on the internet. With episode 84 of Splinterlands 101, joining us again, our co-host of the show, finest gentleman who ever lived, Matt Clark. Here's Matt Clark. He's one of the finest gentlemen that ever lived. Howdy, howdy. The man behind the Pufe Pousse, Geotrix. And Pufe Pousse. <laughs> hello, hello. And joining us tonight for another Behind the Avatar episode, um, a gentleman you will all know, especially if you you do watch the streaming, if you've been around the lands um, or any amount of time, you'll, you'll know this name. Now you get to see the face as well. Uh, I caught a really great episode recently on After Sounds channel, and I, I loved the way that Rogue presented himself. And so I reached out to him immediately after I finished watching the show. I said, man, we'd love to have you on. So we're really excited and glad to welcome to the show tonight, Rogue Patton. What's going on, my friends? Thanks for having me. Appreciate you. I'm joining by my son here for a minute. Oh, wow. While he, <laughs> while he relaxes and calms down and stops screaming at his mom. Sure. <laughs> Yeah. So we start off, I um, would like to ask people initially, just to get the ball rolling, how did you end up here on Splinterlands? Because everyone's story is different. Some people have come from a crypto background and this is their first card trading game. Other people are like OG Magic the Gatherings and this was their introduction to, this was their introduction to crypto and everything in between and beyond. So how did you end up here? In well, Splinterlands. so I ended up here. Uh, I I started dabbling in crypto in in about 2020. That was when uh, you know, started to kind of learn about you know the Fed and you know and about our monetary policy and you know all the shenanigans that are with that. And then so with that, I kind of learned about crypto and then started in crypto the way everybody else does in the uh, in the centralized exchanges. I was doing crypto there, and then I realized that wasn't crypto and. Had to go get a Web3 wallet to go in. And that was in, that was crazy to, to go from the outer realm of central like exchanges into actual Web3 is impossible to do with chump change, which is all I had. Like I was like, I was like, I want to go into Web3 with 20 bucks. No, no, that's like you need at least 100 and you're going to lose $15 of that. But so I was doing that and then, uh, I don't know. Once I got in, you know, I was, I was listening to people. Um, they were talking about, you know, DeFi, um, which I really didn't understand, but like the big thing at the time was NFTs. NFTs were huge. And like, so when I was, I was listening to like Gary V, Gary V had just kind of started doing his like uh, crypto friends or uh, V friends, whatever it was that project. And, um, and, and I was like, I was like, you know, NFTs don't make any sense to me. They don't make any sense at all. They're they're like it's it's pictures, it's pictures, and I'm not gonna buy it as anything more than pictures. And but luckily for me, I have a huge background in trading cards. So like I've always played Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh, Magic. I was raised on them. I was in local game stores. I was like that. That was my life. Like so, up until COVID. I was playing the last game I was playing was called force of will. And I was playing it competitively. I was traveling the world playing force of will. And, uh, in 2019 did tournaments in Vegas, Toronto, Milan, uh, Atlantic city, um, just traveled all over for that game. And it was amazing. And so competitive trading cards, like that's where I was. And so luckily for me, uh, I did a Google search one day, like once I kind of got a grasp on NFTs a little bit, I was just curious. I was like, well, trading cards. God, if those were NFTs, that'd be really smart. I wonder if anybody's come up with that. <laughs> and so I was searching for uh, trading card NFT games and, um, you know, the list came up and Splinterlands was on that list. So it was Skyweaver and Gods Unchained at the time. And so uh, I was playing Skyweaver more regularly because it was kind of more beautiful than Splinterlands and Splinterlands didn't make any sense. Uh, first thing I did when I got to their market is I saw that 
Prince Julian was like a $50,000 card. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, that makes no sense. I'm not playing this game. So <laughs> like, I'm looking at stats and everything. I'm like this. No, that's, I'm not. No, this is, this is, this is more monkey pictures. I'm not doing this. So I ended up coming back to it later at a, at a friend's request that I was playing uh, Skyweaver with essentially. He was just like, man, have you, have you looked at Splinterlands? And I was like, eh, it was like the graphics were off. I didn't like, I didn't like it. The marketplace was weird. And so he ended up getting me back into it. And uh, it really only took a couple weeks, a couple weeks of actually being in it, playing it, town halls, being involved with community. And then boom, all my red flags were gone. I loved everything that I saw and it's been my go-to game ever since. So yeah, that was how I kind of ended up here in Splinterlands. And uh, I'm very blessed that I ended up making it here because I don't do anything else in crypto really at the end of the day. I found my niche, like trading cards has always been my thing. This makes the most sense. I'm the most comfortable in it. Everything else I'd have to trust somebody else to tell me what's going on here. I have a, very clear idea of what's going on and because i know trading card games i have a lot of confidence in these cards so you touched on a couple of key points there um we've like geo he was full-on into Yu-Gi-Oh, and i was like what is Yu-Gi-Oh?" and of course this gentleman here matt has pj um <laughs> and touched on those and it's really interesting, like when you first like said like NFTs, trading cards, but you, you're lucky you didn't come at the beginning because it was just like when it first launched, just a JPEG. Exactly. And I've never understood NFTs. Like the internet is full of JPEG images. You can right click, mm -hmm. you can download. Why on earth am I going to spend money to buy one? Um, that yep. was that was my thing of NFTs. But luckily when I got into Splinters, I didn't even know what an NFT was. Um, I was relatively new. Well, I was completely new to crypto. The steam it was my introduction to crypto. Mm. And I have a good, fr a really good friend known for years through the hip hop scene here in Melbourne, who is famous in the Anacapulco circuit as the guy who got deported from Mexico. And while he was in Australia, he stayed at my place for a couple of weeks while he was like trying to sort stuff out. And yeah, he got me into crypto. Uh, ever, ever grateful for that. And nice. back then on the DTube days and the, where the cycle was, it's making like $120 US a video um, with, with DTube upvotes and that sort of stuff. But I didn't have an account with any exchanges, not even a centralized exchange. I had no idea. And I'm earning all this steam and I have no idea what to do with it. So, of course, Splinterlands came out. And said, oh, I can buy these with steam. Sweet. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it's been exactly. a huge, huge journey like, for me. That's a, that's a very interesting point because, like, there's a – I think there's a level of, like, if, if everyone takes the U.S. dollar value off of it and the central exchange and the off-ramp aspect to it, everything that we're doing in Hive – in this ecosystem could just be a game anywhere else. It could be its own ecosystem. It could be whatever, you know, and I, I know personally like playing games as long as I have, I have no problem spending in game currency to level up my stuff. It makes sense. It's how you progress in the game. So like that was also something that like Splinterlands, like it, it just made a bunch of sense to me. It was like, I will always be leveling up my stuff and, and shuffling around assets within to just progress my account because that's the game, you know? And so, so for you, you know, going like, you're like, yeah, I never off ramped and I have all of this internet money. Like, of course, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna dump it all in the packs. <laughs> you're yeah. like the next internet thing came along and that's the thing I'm going to buy. <laughs> And we do need gamers, right? We need we need gamers as much as we need crypto investors because oh, yeah. crypto investor will throw a whole lot of chips, you know, push a whole lot of chips into the middle of the table, but he's expecting them back at some point. Whereas a, yeah. a player, you, hey, I just want to get better at the game and, and get better cards. Exactly. And the idea of, of weakening my my position by by selling some for outside money is yeah. yeah. I mean, it's there. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, that it's as there. After Sound says, licking his ice yeah. cream or whatever. Eh, no, no, you, you put that in the freezer. 
and you just let it get bigger. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, there's so much from just your, just your brief introduction there. You, you know, it's, it strikes on so many, so many points for me. I could, I could literally just talk your ear off. You said earlier, you said before we started recording that you're a chatterbox and I'm, I'm thinking, yeah, just in what you said there, I could, I could personally talk for three hours. Uh, your experience is you essentially, and I don't think we've seen this before with anyone we've spoken to, you deduced that this would exist. Oh, <laughs> you just didn't know the name of it, right? Yeah. Crypto trading cards, NFTs, an actual mm -hmm. playable game. And you went looking for exactly what this is. But even then, we missed the boat. You saw PJ and went, oh, yeah, nah, and, and went somewhere else. And that's incredibly useful feedback because y you are exactly what the game needs, right? Guys like you, another thousand guys like you, and we're set. Guys who aren't looking to cash out immediately, guys who really want to engage and play as a human, not a bot. Uh, and guys who are looking, for, if someone's looking exactly for what we have, right? Mm -hmm. And then they go, ah, yeah, and they go over here instead. We're doing something wrong. And I think maybe it's because uh, PJ is, uh, it's on one hand, it's great to have these big sticker prices because you go, wow, there's a lot of move, money moving around in here. But on the other, I think, if you're used to a game like uh, Pokemon or Yu-Gi-Oh or something, uh, uh, a game with physical cards, and you then see a high price tag, you don't know what the circulation's like. What, do, what How many are there in existence? And the thing with PJ is there were only ever 90 made. Mm -hmm. And so that drives the price through the roof because they're just so scarce. I bought mine, I think, at about $500 perhaps. And the one before that, Archmage Arius, Again, there were only 90 of those made. I got that one, that with the mystery potion. that You could buy daily mystery potions at the time. So I, I got him for uh, just for one of those potions. and then. But I have a, I had a mate who's since left the game. He had five Archmage Arius. And he just, when he, get, when he, he just sold up, I think he dropped them for $400 each or something on the, uh, on the market, just gave up and left. And those are the bargains that the people who are around to play can dive on uh, when they happen, but I think that so many of the PJs and the Arias, because there was such a such a limited supply, they are just through the roof as far as price goes. Because the people who hold them just don't want to let go of them cheap. So that mm -hmm. I think we need to maybe work on and say, look, <laughs> maybe the font for the price could be this big, but the you know total <laughs> world supply can be here in big glowing letters. So somebody like you arrives and says, okay, yeah, wow, these are really expensive. Oh, well, that's because there's only 90 of them in the world. Okay, that's, yeah. that's making more sense to me now. Um, but yeah, that's great um, uh, to hear how you how you got here. Tell me about your name. What's, what's that come from? Rogue. Uh, so, you know, Patton's, Patton's my last name. So I've always kind of carried that. I've been big in the sports my whole life. And uh, so Patton has always been, you know, uh, uh, how I'm recognized, you know, on the field, on the, you it know, sounds sporty. In... <laughs> right. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> and, uh, so yeah, I've always, I've always been a fan of, you know, re representing my last name and rogue actually came from the competitive team that I co-founded in Splinterlands was called the rogues guild and the rogues guild, um, in trading card games, uh, a rogue deck is something that is non meta. Um, and is unpredictable um, because not a lot of people play it and not a lot of people test against it because it's not part of the known meta. So um, a rogue deck, um, uh, somebody that is, you know, competent enough in the game and can understand the meta can create um, rogue concepts and be able to run into a tournament and take down um, a tournament because you know what everybody else is playing, but nobody knows what you're playing. Um, and then after your first couple tournaments, it's not a rogue deck anymore. It's part of the meta. So, but yeah, the rogue skilled was um, uh, pretty notorious for that because we, uh, it was interesting playing trading card games and I'm, I'm positive. You could probably say this for Yu-Gi-Oh! Cause I think Yu-Gi-Oh! is probably the worst about it is your um, competitive players your best players are oftentimes kind of clicked up in like a boys club and they don't really yeah. share a lot of their information. They're very uh, like, you don't get to talk to them until you beat them. 
is kind of like the way that it goes. And if, if you, if you don't prove yourself, you don't get any insight, you don't get any ability to communicate. Right. And so there was a group of people like that in, in force of will, some of the best. And so like rogues field came along as just a bunch, a group of people who weren't, who weren't a part of the elites, but had talent and we were proving a concept that, you know, comes from the Bible, you know, steel sharpens steel. And the concept is that you can surround yourself with people of a like goal and with practice, with determination and with, every, with that like goal in mind, you guys can achieve greatness, right? And so that's what we did was we got together and we said, look, like nobody else is going to kind of talk about this stuff with us. Like we're going to hash this out ourselves and we're going to just come out of left field and, and do it. And um, and we did uh, our first tournament as the Rogues Guild was Vegas in 2019. Nope. End of 2018. No, it was beginning of 2019. And uh, we ended up taking first, second and third. I got third place uh, and two of my boys got first with Rogue uh, first and second with Rogue decks. Um, I was on a rogue Brunhild deck and the other two brought pandas. Panda was not meta at all. And I know I know you guys don't know what that means, but like. It, it was no, it was not a competitive deck at all, but you know, we took down first and second with it because we tested and we knew the meta and we knew what all the best people were going to play and we took them down for it. So yeah, coming into crypto, I was just like, you know what? Rogue Patton. We'll take on the rogue Guild because I don't know. I've still got this like dream in my mind that the rest of like the rogue Guild team will end up getting their heads out of their, uh, you know, keisters and get on into crypto and maybe join me later. You know, because I'd love to have the team in here hashing stuff out and like learning this game with me because so maybe there'll be a, you know, a rogue shilling and a, you know, uh rogue Stuart and a rogue, you know, uh, it's, it's uh, it'd be cool. It's very but, I'll make a prediction. Top top of the next bull run. That's when they'll all join in. Yeah, so right. On. Be like, what is... <laughs> and I'll be delegating them decks and that'll be pretty cool. Yeah. That'll yeah. be pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, and then then you have to hear about it for two years as the prices decline again from where they bought in. They'll they'll wait until your account's worth two hundred grand, and then they'll go, "Oh yeah, I'll, I'm going to buy in now." Yeah, that's a great idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Sorry, sorry, G, I cut you off. No, nah, no, nah, you didn't. You didn't. Uh, I have a sort of a similar story where Bob was in the Steam ecosystem. And he was making videos, but I, because I, I didn't understand centralized exchanges or crypto at all. I was like, I can't even get into this game, even if I wanted to. I had, we had no clue. And um, what you were saying about the art direction, because I was spoiled by Yu Gi Oh and like just the, come on, like the art in Yu Gi Oh. Japanese animation is is it's good, phenomenal, is good. And, and my first one, when I first looked at it, I was like, Man, it looks a bit looks a two bit basic, but the, mm -hmm. it was so surface level. I shouldn't have looked at it like that, but I did. I was like, eh. you know, that's our surface level without like re um, regarding the other things that made it so special. Mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, that was sort of like when you said the art direction, I was like, yeah, that that's exactly what I, that held me back as um, also alongside the crypto to get into crypto as well, with, like to get into like the hive ecosystem or the steam ecosystem. I, I had no clue how to do any of that. But now they they've like made it so much easier with the PayPal onboarding with mm -hmm. credits. We we've they've just reworked the Terra block sort of mm -hmm. crypto uh bridges and all that, whatever you want to call them. It, it's beautiful now. Like I had um some SPS stuck on the um Binance smart chain. I couldn't get it off. Only now that, that they like in the last two days they reworked it, I managed. I was like, Yes, yes, <laughs> thank you. Like, you, you, this is what I wanted. Like, they, they did it, they yeah. did it, and that's what we need. We just it, easier from, from like the just the uh, normal realm to onboard into uh, the crypto verse as well. So, yeah, it was yeah. Really, really cool. That was my onboarding experience in a <laughs> nutshell, yeah. No, it's been pretty cool because uh, since I've been here, you know, I, I think just also being a part of this community is I've uh, I've gotten, you know, one on one lessons in a lot of crypto just just by being a part of this community. You know, there's certain 
foundational knowledge that you just have to learn over time, you know, and stuff passively that, you know, like, uh, I remember the first time I looked at Hive Engine, I was like, I have no idea what in the world this is. Like, cause I, the only thing I'd done at that point was maybe a couple swaps on like, I think it was on Polygon. I went to like Dragon Swap or something. I don't, I don't remember. It was, it was something over there. And uh, yeah, coming over here, the Hive Engine, I was like, I don't, I didn't even know tribal decks was a thing. Hive engine was all that I, I knew. And yeah, just through the course of being here, you know, I'm learning about LPs, you know, learning about staking, learning about um, all these things as different games pop up, you know, I'm learning about more of those. Uh, I've gotten a lot of lessons in YGG SPO, you know, when I got involved with them, um, you know, learned a lot there, minted uh, a badge on Ethereum, uh, learned about transferring stuff on Ethereum, uh, ended up like we get rewards uh, in these gap programs. It's a uh, guild advancement programs. They come up with quests for us to do like every four months or something like that. And we get paid out in YGG tokens for completing these quests. And so, you know, but when we get paid, we get paid in Polygon. So I had to learn how to bridge from Polygon to Ethereum, do a swap over there, then bridge over to like all of a sudden. And now I'm the guy that's like, Hey, I'm moving all my coins tonight. Like because Ethereum's cheapest at Saturday night at 10 PM, my time. So like, Anybody else just want to send me your tokens? I'll do it all at once. I'm the guy now. I wasn't. <laughs> I knew nothing about all of this, but now I'm like the I'm I'm doing the bridges and I'm handling people's assets and like I'm not freaking out about it, you know. And I was the very first time. That very first yeah. bridge, I didn't realize like my funds got stuck on the bridge and I freaked out because my first gap payout was like a thousand bucks. And I was just like, Oh wow, this is amazing. Like I just magical internet money. And, <laughs> and so I bridged, but I didn't realize that like I had enough funds, but again, that like you need more money than you think you do type of thing. So like I had just enough gas to do it. And then I didn't. And then like the prices started to go up on gas and so I didn't realize that like the ETH gas on the other side was holding my transaction up. And so I just, I had a thousand dollars that wasn't in my wallet. That wasn't anywhere. I didn't know how to track down transactions or understand where anything was. I was just like, I pissed it all down the drain. There it is. This is my crypto story. <laughs> but no, I ended up finally. And again, through awesome people in the community, they were just like, they took my transaction notes and they were like, yeah, no, you're still on the bridge. It's just waiting for the transaction to complete on the other side because you don't have enough Ethereum in your wallet. I was like, great. And so that's literally from that one. It was like, always have $50 in Ethereum in your wallet. And I was like, ah, that's a lot of money. And he's like, yeah, just don't think about it. Literally leave $50 over there and you'll never have this issue again. Just don't, just don't freak out. You've just got $50 sitting somewhere and you can't use it. I'm like, that's weird. <laughs> Ethereum. Yeah. I mean, it is weird compared yeah. to like other ecosystems. It's fucking really weird. Yeah. Excuse my, excuse my French. <laughs> it's so weird. But yeah, I've just, I've learned a lot since I've been here. And so like, it's, I, it's it, Splinterlands has been really, really good to me. Really good to me. Yeah. It's, it's funny how this whole thing shifts your thinking. I, I've found myself, I don't want stuff that's real anymore that exists in the real world. Because if it's over here, you've got it and you want it over there, you've got to pick it up and move it over there. I, I want yeah. stuff that's not anywhere, right? Actually, physically existing seems like something of a, um, like a, uh, a, that's a downside. Why would you want something like that? It's got weight. Storage in nightmare. That area, yeah. And that's something I want to talk about. You've, you've no doubt got large collections then of physical cards. Do you do you miss that idea of actually physically holding the card in your hand, or or do you do you just sort of revel in the fact that it can't get bent, it can't get twisted, it can't get lost, basically? That's just one box. That's one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I. Uh, so, yes and no. One, I would say the only thing that I actually appreciated about physical trading cards was sitting across from my opponent in a match. That was the only thing that was amazing for me. Everything else was exactly what you said. It was a hassle management sorting. Like, I mean, that was cool when I didn't have four kids, 
like that like i was just like yeah let's take two hours just to like mentally zone and sort through cards and like sort them by color Ooh, you know that, that that's that's young man stuff like i don't have the time <laughs> to be doing that but um you know realistically uh management of of th those kind of cards uh the yeah the pristine nature of them um all of that is is absolutely more of a hindrance and that's also one of the beautiful things that I love about Splinterlands is that thing that I just showed you, those are all what's called bulk cards. So like in a booster pack of normal trading cards, they come with like 15 cards. There's only like two of them in there that are any good, like period. The rest of them are all commons, which don't get played in the majority of games. Like that yeah. that's not real in meta decks it's not a competitive thing you're opening up all this stuff and those are called bolt commons and they're not worth anything you go to the l you go to the trading card store and you trade like a thousand of those in for like three dollars is is essentially like what the going rate is and i think it's just recycling at that point or it's it's yeah. essentially just like a thing that's like hey yeah give me a thousand cars i will literally pay someone to sort through them and make sure you didn't screw up and leave a ten dollar card in there you know that's exactly what that the bulk buy is for but here in splinterlands there is no bulk it's constantly deflationary you know it's it's perfect you know it's it creates a game where each card can play at 10 different levels. You know what I mean? So like there's, there's variety in the card itself. Um, and yeah, the, the commons are just as playable as the legendaries. You need them all by the way the game is set up, you know, having a big collection makes sense. Um, so yeah, it just, it all fit well with me. The only thing I miss is sitting down for my opponent, picking up reads, talking to him, like, like really kind of toying with them jedi mind tricks like all of that was fun it was really fun because like when when you're actually sitting across from someone trying to beat them like it's not just the cards in your hand that are like assets in your arsenal you know so i feel like that's the only thing that's been taken from me in splinterlands is it is just me and this computer and the algorithm there's only so much i can do i can think about it a lot and but there's no, I can't make my opponent screw up. I can't like Human anticipate element. or like force a play line out of my opponent, you know. You're going to enjoy the second half of this show then. <laughs> Cause that's what we normally do is battle. Nice. Uh, and, and normally it's just sort of, you know, seeing the other guy sticking his tongue out trying to pick his team. But uh, yeah, I, no, I absolutely <laughs> hear what you're saying. And there's, I see that satisfaction in my eight year old's eyes. When she drops the last card in you know when she says you know and then you change it to yellow and she's you see it light up and yes here it is yellow <laughs> <laughs> the thrill of victory and that, that in person is yeah, there's nothing like it yeah it's funny though. And that's why you know splinter fest such... was amazing yeah splinter fest was amazing because i got the taste of an in-person event even though we were at computers it, it was it it was it was there that competitiveness was there that passion um that ability to kind of uh, um com not commiserate like to to enjoy the experience with the people surrounding you like that was huge it felt like a trading card game tournament that i was at and so we need more of those but it can definitely be organized better a lot more like i would love more heads up tournament style brackets like they just copy and pasted their splinterlands tournament format into splinterfest and it, it, that was kind of meh but the event was great sorry go ahead bubba fett it was actually i was just jumping in to fill a gap like but uh, <laughs> get, you know, the dead air sort of thing but it fixed itself i was just going to mention like matt mentioned you know and it, like that just brought back like a flood of memories such a simple basic one of the most simplest basic games out there but you can just play it for hours it's like the, the the limited tools at your disposal what you can do with those tools i love mm -hmm. uno yeah <laughs> people people love to bend the rules on uno they make up their rules when the situation best suits them <laughs> Oh yeah, stacking reverses or stacking draws or whatever, and you're just like, no, you can. Yes, I can. No, you can. Yeah. Yes, I can. 
and, like and, draw and sixteen, you're and you're like, screw you guys, you just made this and, up. You're trying to look up the rules, and it's like, where is it? Like, <laughs> everyone's got their own versions. Yeah, and that's yeah. another interesting thing about like print rates. Um, with like Yu Gi Oh, they will revitalize older cards mm -hmm. in newer editions. It's like, oh, here you go. And also, it's not legendary now. We've made it in common. Enjoy. And, and and the old guys are like, no, like we don't want that. We don't want it, if all the all the other people to use those cards. Like, you know, yeah, I feel like that took out the fun of it as well. At least here, you know, like there's one edition, there's one card, it's got a set limit, and they're not reprinting it in another edition or set. And you know how much is there. Like that's the other, yeah. like it's like OCD is awesome because you can literally see do the exact card. How much is in circulation? There's no surprises. It's not like there's a pallet of these at a Walmart somewhere and you're just like, oh, look, found like 17 more cases. You know, it was just like, no, like they knew from the state, like this is yeah. the print rate. This is what it is. And we can watch it go down for the, like forever because there can be more of me that's going to be scooping stuff up and combining. Like so I'm, I'm not going to hesitate. <laughs> so you is like the Fed in a way. You know, that, that company. Exactly. Yeah. They're just, they're just their like, own. they're like, yeah, let's make blue eyes common white dragon. Yeah. Let's no, go. That's not what it's supposed Everybody. To be. Everybody should have one. <laughs> and once the um, previous edition reward cards, so the last rewards before Soul Bounds, when they started to run out, we were checking the stats on that weekly but each week we were checking like oh Pelican bandit oh, it's almost gone we need to get some more of those and the con contra um, yeah it's amazing there's not that big of a price difference for how meta some of those cards are versus the others that's when you know like you're still like it's not player demand it's investor demand or it's something else because like the the heat smith is out pricing the mercenary no stop like go home that's not yeah. true <laughs> it's like if we're talking about the game of splinterlands no i'm not paying more for a heat smith than the the one of the best green tanks in the game like come on yeah that's kia kids yeah that's kia kids he's that's, he's, that's... he's one of our one of our aussies he's been stacking heat smiths like nobody's business a lot of people <laughs> saw what i did with flesh golems and they said oh i want to do that same thing but yeah right everybody pick a card <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, and that's that's great. I'm like, I'm all for it, but it's. But you picked uh, the meta and, card. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I did. I did well there. Did but you know it was, it was meta when you did it? No, no, I just figured a card that heals <laughs> itself is going to be going to be. What 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 really got me, and this goes back to what you were talking about a minute ago, is I spent a bit of time thinking about the difference between physical cards and and crypto and NFTs, and. I, I remember thinking, hang on, people are going to, just like your big folder there with, with lots of cards, I thought people who are used to physical cards are going to undervalue common cards because they're sick of dealing with big bulk, trying to, you know, find them, where's that common card I wanted, right? And so that the focus is going to be on legendaries, but knowing that they're digital and knowing that you can just store an infinite amount, it doesn't doesn't matter on your, on your computer, I thought they're going to undervalue common. So I'm going to pick a common card and I'm just going to try and corner the market on that. I've always been fascinated by like rubber barons of the, you know, trying to corner the copper market a hundred years ago, that type of thing. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll just focus on one common card. And I don't know, the flesh column just seemed, he seemed like uh, what somebody you'd guess. want to build an army out of <laughs> let's go uh, and yeah oh when the llama came along i was like yeah this is great that the llama is i, I always feel that like the llama is the is the developer's love letter to me right thanks for supporting <laughs> our game man yeah, yeah. The llama. It, is, it is the llama <laughs> no that's that's perfect because yeah when i like i i was i was that was one of the questions that i really wanted to ask you was like it was was there a a pretty deep understanding of the game when you chose the flesh golem like as your army uh, cause that's uh, like, it turned out to be a great call. Like you yeah. could have done worse with other commons. Like you could have picked oh, other yeah. commons and done worse, you know? Definitely. Rusty definitely. Android. Yeah. I, yeah. Rusty <laughs> Android. He was, he was a bit later on as a reward. I've, I've got, I've stacked a lot of those actually, just in case. Mm -hmm. But now that, so for me, it was thinking, okay, magic gets past armor. So if mm -hmm. I've got somebody who can intrinsically resist magic, I don't have to worry about mm -hmm. stacking armor on him. He's got a reasonable amount of health, like quite a lot. And he heals himself. Just figured that's that's got to be, that that's like a baseline good, right? Yep. Um, and 
uh, items and spells were talked about fairly early on as a you know some sort of a like maybe maybe there's going to be a second uh, layer of gameplay and so I kind of thought well if I've got the if we've got a base of self healing and an intrinsic resistance to magic then other stuff that, that gives me a lot of versatility in what I could put on him right maybe I could put boots of flying on him or maybe I could put a you know a sort of add fire damage or however it all pans out but I don't need to do much if I know that 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 resistance is there that high health um and and healing himself between you know between rounds is what yeah. i was thinking so it's a good um, cost yeah, too was, like he's yeah. not expensive it's, it's it's a good good mana card you know he's well yeah. fleshed out <laughs> <I like> yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. there it is so as i mentioned at the beginning of the show like one thing that really got my attention was after sounds uh show that that rogue appeared on there and um in pre-chat we were discuss like here in like max in uh south australia adelaide we have seven states in australia where geo and i live in melbourne right? we had some serious serious tyranny during the the lockdowns you know, police shooting protesters with rubber bullets um and you know, i think like although i was already onto it myself what really like was a massive like positive, I guess you could say it came out of it was people's distrust of the mainstream media. Um, we had a, a, a protest movement because like no one was allowed to work and like people were you know, losing money. Uh, the tradies were like the main group that really picked up momentum during this protest in the city. They had a slogan every day because um, we had a, a curfew, 9 p.m. curfew. We had five kilometer radius most you could try like it was full on tyranny and you go down the shops you're allowed to leave the house for like one hour a day or something to do food shopping which is the, everything else was closed unless you were a, a grocery retail you were not allowed to even open and you go down to the shopping center and there's packs of police down there checking people's id to make sure that you had not traveled more than five kilometers and if you did not have photo ID on you, it was an arrestable offence. You were arrested for not having photo mm. ID. Hello, for <laughs> Australia, not, not really Australia testing out up that fifteen-minute city concept. Yeah, I think you were arrested for giving up your guns in '96 and not having photo ID. <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, and what we we had, you know, you what you get to see what's going on in other places you always have a limited view uh, i was watching max egan's videos every day jeff berwick's dollar, dollar vigilante videos every day trying to get a track of what's happening in, in other places and like we we found that australia like every time i spoke to international people australia was like making the news everywhere else for like tyranny and mm -hmm. apparently we we helped settle the gun debate in the united states so like there you go you know, people who were and anti guns before is like oh, nope do <laughs> whatever you do don't end up like australia do not give up your guns um so i mean realistically here, you can look at like everywhere in the world and like get a like why you don't give up your guns argument you know like i think the most recent one for me is uh ukraine you know like depending on how you look at ukraine like or whatever the narrative is there which one you like choose to kind of go with like at the end of the day a country came into another country and that country couldn't defend itself without asking the government's permission to be armed that's wrong <laughs> like uh like that's just no like ev ev everyone should know that there's a consequence if you come across that border with ill intent and it ain't gonna be just distributed by the military it'll be distributed by the boys and girls of that country too and uh yeah so that was the most recent one but yeah uh you look at i mean hell you look at everywhere you look at europe you look at uh australia and yeah it's 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 clear and obvious that if you disarm the people like uh you're giving up a lot of uh a lot of freedom to say something about it one one thing i highlighted during these protests um it started off like you know a thousand people and the next that was ten thousand and it reached point there's a hundred thousand in the city of melbourne uh bear in mind now the population of melbourne of, of victoria is only seven million 
Australia, a uh, uh, huge, huge country. Um, I don't know how many times USA fits into Australia. It's a huge country, but our population is only 26 million because most of the country is desert. <laughs> you look at the map of Australia, the middle is mm -hmm. all yellow and brown. There's this little strip of green around the edge where we all live. Um, but yeah, 100,000 and the media were reporting, you know, like even at 10,000, it was like a few right wing extremist neo Nazi, mm -hmm. <laughs> just that sort of. But it was mums and dads, tradies, kids, but all being portrayed. And at a hundred thousand, they couldn't like really hide it anymore. And they admit they said ten thousand people on mainstream media. And there's this uh, alternative news network called Rebel News. I don't know if mm. you've seen that before. We started watching that, and at one protest in the city, they showed a, a side view of one of our main commercial networks, Channel Seven, and it was showing like live feed the views. And Channel 7, their viewers were just dropping like bricks in, in free fall. And Rebel News' viewers are going up, 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 up. Um, nice. So a lot of people just woke up to, to the mainstream media. Like, yeah. Like, that, that was a good thing. Um, but yeah, this, this, was, this was like uh, your wake up call you were saying before. How, how did that come about? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, so when, when COVID happened, um, you know, there was just, uh, I, I, for the first three weeks of COVID, I was lockstep with the narrative. I was like, as soon as they were talking about it, I'm like, oh crap, we're all going to die. This is zombies. Like, this is how we're going to get zombies. Like, great. And, and I remember, you know, it was like <laughs> the first week or something like that, you know, uh, my wife was talking about like, you know, going to see the family. And I, I remember looking at her and be like, we can't go anywhere. Like we can't, like if we leave, we could kill them. Like, th like I was that, like that with it, you know what I mean? And, um, and through the course of it, you know, um, the programming just kind of started to, started to dwindle. You know, I started to see a lot of hypocrisies in, uh, you know, what was being said to us, what was being communicated, what was actually physically happening. You know, I think that was really one of the, one of the biggest things, you know, is like they keep telling you all the time. It's like, yeah, no, every, everybody's dying. It, it's just like every is bodies on bodies on bodies. And like, it's just basically unsafe out there. And you go outside and like, it's no different. Like it, it was physically no different outside than it had been before, you know, less people on the streets, but like nowhere near the carnage. And so like, you know, they would say all this stuff, but then like, you know, but then essential workers, like essential workers had to keep going. And it was like, all right, well, can't be that deadly then. And, you know, and then it was just it was more and more and more. And then I started like asking questions. And then once I started asking questions, then all of a sudden I found some people that were also asking questions. And then uh, one rabbit trail after another. And uh, yeah, I got a full world change. Um than I had at the beginning of 2020. So thank you, government, for the giant awakening. Uh, I am definitely part of the uh, great awakening that was happening in 2020. So very, very happy to be a part of it. Happy to be on this side of, you know, an understanding of what happened. Because, uh, man, if I was still regurgitating, uh, yeah, it'd be a, it'd be a weird life. Just got to crack onto one thing, and then you start. Uh, it just bleeds into other areas. Yeah. Um, like for the last twenty years, my big thing's been history, and um, I've I've worked a lot with the uh, as an archaeologist, the Indigenous peoples of Australia, and I've been privy to listening to some of their stories, com and comparing that to the history I was taught in school. Um, it's it's just Two, two different worlds, completely yeah. two different worlds. And in, even even with history, you know, we count in numbers, 50, 100, 150, 200 years, 1,000 years. It's very it's very mathematical, analytical. So I just a robot sort of, you know, side, it's like kicks in. Um, but I was working on one particular job at Rottnest Island off the coast of WA. Uh, this was back in about 2004. 
and the elder that I was working with, he was in his 50s back then, and he told me some stories that his grandmother told him when he was a boy, and this really put things into perspective because his grandmother was alive when the British first arrived in Australia, like the, the first ships, like three generations. Like that's, that's yesterday in, in the scheme of things. Mm -hmm. you know, and if you look at you know, Mexico or South America when the Spanish arrived, like you know, so long ago, it's like you know, now we're talking about biological warfare, smallpox, ridden black, but like who can you actually talk to? No one. But when it's only three generations ago, and that was a huge wake up call for me, like their history was so different to ours. Like the first ships that arrived were not settlers. The first ships that arrived were British soldiers. Like they came here with, like they knew what was here and they came here to eradicate the existing hunter gatherer population before the settling ships arrived. And it was just like in Perth, because this is where it was, it was just ma one massacre after another. Um, it was just kill on sight. Uh, the, now their history is so different to ours. But now yeah. we conveniently separate that. We have history, they have myth and legend. Um, and that, that happens yeah. right across the world. Um, but yeah, history and then in the last four or five years, like delving deep into the, the stolen history, like you know, the pre-civilization, the pre-reset, no, it's very loosely, it's a term Tartaria, which is, it's, there is, there was a Tartaria, you look at the maps to 1500, it's all over the maps, but it's, yet it's not mentioned in history. Um, but the term Tartaria is used quite loosely in a community that recognizes you know, something happened two to 300 years ago. Mm -hmm. So let's know four, four generations Know, what what do you know beyond what your grandparents can tell you? Nothing. And exactly. nowadays, how many kids listen to their grandparents? Right? Yeah. Technology has replaced the elder wisdom. And now they're just stupid. Or, or they can't even sit. Uh, even when I was in Wednesday, I had to go to my folks place once a week and set up their video recorder for my dad so he can pro get his programs one week ahead so that yep. technology is really the, the the new each generation they now look at the elders as just stupid people who you know, can't keep up so yeah but that was that was programmed that was all kind of yeah. part of the the initiative like when i this is this is all stuff that i kind of thought about a lot too because i grew up with parents that i that i didn't respect um, they didn't, uh, they weren't, um, you know, uh, idle citizens. They weren't like, uh, you know, they, they were living off the government, you know, doing their best to support us, not really like doing anything prideful with their lives and everything. And everything that I was learning in school, they couldn't teach me everything that I was doing in sports. They had no history on, like I was living a, a whole life that literally had nothing to do with them. When I think about my history and like my growing up, I think about me and my four brothers and the two parents were NPCs. And that's not entirely their fault at the end of the day, because when I, when I really start to think about it and I look back and I'm like, okay, you know, what kind of like, what kind of shows was I watching? What kind of stuff was I watching? Like one of my favorite cartoons was fairly odd parents. I was like, okay, fairly odd parents. Here we go. Kid by himself, babysitters, the antagonist, two parents are absolute goofballs that are never flipping around. Like they're not a thing. Look at the Simpsons, two parents, absolute goofballs, don't know anything. You know, it's just like this whole like the youth is the answer. The 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 adults have ruined everything and it's up to the kids. Like that narrative is still going today, and it's sprinkled into flipping everything. You know, you go into like you go into the majority of the Disney movies. It's not like middle aged men that are saving the world. You know what I mean? It's it's flipping Simba who lost his father and, and is now finding his own way and coming back to save everybody. You know, it's it's always the kid that is fixing what the adults have screwed up. So then you have people like Greta Thunberg that get to come along and be like, how dare you? you've ruined everything you know what i mean so it's like it, the, the narrative is there like all adults are idiots all children are basically our only hope 
And so they're raised with this kind of, I was raised with this kind of, they don't get it. They don't get it. They're, you know, they're not really, you know, and then eventually you turn into an adult and you're just like, oh, all right. <laughs> I see what's happening here. So, yeah, there's in in historically, I remember that was also like part of my awakening. Like when I was I remember praying in, in 2019 uh, because it was very heavy on the rhetoric that that Trump was basically the reincarnation of Hitler. Um, and that like this was lockstep, everything that Hitler did with the rise of power, blah, blah, blah. And and I was like, it it, it just. It, it kept pounding on my heart. What was it like? What happened to be a man in Germany during Hitler's rise? What did it look like? What did it, what happened that like an everyday person could allow something like that, as they say, to happen? You know what I mean? Like, and so it just kept hitting me. It was like, these are the things that I need to know because all I know is the history that's been taught. You know what I mean? And so, like, they're saying all over the news that this is basically step one, two, three. This is him. This is Hitler. This is exactly how Hitler came to be. And if Trump sticks around, we're basically Germany. And it was like, all right, I, mm, I got to think about this. You know, because, yeah, the 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 truth is in our our history. It's in all of the experiences that we've had. Um, but the biggest question, and I can still say this about my parents, is were they even aware enough to know? You know, like if I did pry their brains about stuff that they experienced in their life, would they tell me? like organic thoughts that they've had or have they just been, you know, like drip drop with the narrative the whole time, you know what I mean? Like, so yeah, it's, it's an interesting time. And that's also one of my big drives nowadays is I got four kids. I got four kids that are coming up into a world post COVID and I have to remember what happened. I have to remember what happened. I have to tell people what happened because we already see it. There are many stories about literally what happened for the last three years. You know what I mean? And it's up to us to be able to convey that to the next generation because they, they're not, they didn't experience it, you know? And so, yeah, it's history is it's huge. And, you know, the people who get to write the history books are the ones that win. So like, you know, we're going to get to generation. Back. Each generation that, that you can get away with a massive paradigm shift, and like one one particular thing that um, always like I go back to, and, and you can argue it's a good thing because it's it's always a good thing, right? Admittedly, but it's it's a slippery slope. Um, I got out of the navy in 1990, and like went went into the civilian workforce, and. The, the level of brainwashing through mainstream media and so forth was so obvious to me because of the level of brainwashing that I'd received in the military. Um, I've used the example before at a ship on sea, uh, on a ship at sea, this is the eighties. So no mobile phones, no internet, right? We got something every day called ship's daily orders. It was an A4 piece of paper with about 10 to 12 bullet point notes on it. And that was the world news. That's everything we knew that was going on in the world out so off the ship on an A4 piece of paper and 10 to 12 bullet forms. But that was all we knew. So if they told us something, why would we not believe them? Yeah. You know, it's, you know, um, yeah. So, and back then, like everywhere you went, it, you know, smoking was the big thing. You watched any TV show, everyone's smoking. In fact, I watched an interview with the, um, can't remember his name now, with that mind blank still kicking in. The guy, uh, Rod Sterling, that started The Twilight Zone. I saw an interview he did on some black and white TV show, I think, I can't, no, like Long Jeans type thing, but you know, it's armchair sort of interview. And he was saying that the whole premises behind The Twilight Zone 
when it went that his sales pitch to the movie network was to sell cigarettes. Because every time someone got stressed, something scary, going like, what's going on? Like, s- everyone's smoking, ashtrays everywhere. And Rod said, when he starts his intro e- each episode, he's always standing there with a cigarette. And that was his sales mm-hmm. pitch to the networks. I'm going to sell cigarettes. Um, but you walk into an office building somewhere, the receptionist sitting there at the front desk. And there's a huge big ashtray on the front desk. You know, she's smoking, g'day, love, how's it going? You know, it's like mm-hmm. uh, buses. Movie cinemas, they all had ashtrays in the, in the armrests, buses, trains, airplanes, everything. And, of course, then nowadays, like this, this whole voting age generation never had that experience. Right? Now, you can argue that that's a good thing, but at the same token, you're taking choice away from people. Okay, you don't want to smoke, don't smoke. But um, just... That room, you know, a whole world where you could walk around and smoke anywhere. This generation has never experienced that. And compulsory seat belts in cars, yeah, it's a good idea. It's, it's a good safe thing. But again, it's taking the choice, the sovereignty away. Helmets when riding a push bike. Uh, it's just step by step, and every time it's a good argument. You cannot argue against the logic of these things, but it's just another withdrawal of a, a, a sovereign choice that you get to make that's now being made mm-hmm. for you. Uh, and it only takes one generation to completely remove the experience that someone had. Like just travel pre 9 11 as well. Like you go yeah. to the airport now, it's, it's normal to be harassed, body searched. Uh, you know, it's just, it's normal now. Pe- people didn't ha- have this freedom. And it, like you said, if we don't hold on to the things that we had and pass it on to the next generation, and then through popular culture, TV, movies, etc., if that generation is not even prepared to listen to you, yeah, where, where do we go from there? Sorry, Matt. Yeah. No, that's okay. I, I agree entirely. Um, no, I was just saying we've got to get him back on because he's, He's got an elegant mind that's only just turned in this direction. I can tell there's like a there's a freshness and enthusiasm there, but there's also a, a sharpness and a clarity of thought. When I uh, <clears throat> sort of, I guess, my my awakening uh, was largely economics based and understanding uh, all of that. But one thing that really triggered me, and and I once I sort of got it, once I realised that okay, the government doesn't serve us, we're you know we're victims of it, then a lot of things that I'd been wondering about fell into place. And one of them that I, I don't know why I'm uh, bringing it up now, but it just seems to be uh, pertinent is juries. I always, I remember learning at school that juries are there as a check against state overreach. Like that was part of what keeps us safe from the government getting out of control was juries. And they'll, they'll you know, um, uh, that that's you, it's a jury of your peers. It's not some highfalutin bureaucrats. It's a jury of your peers. Uh, but I started thinking about that. And I thought there's two roles here. There's, there's, there's discerning what happened which you kind of want a legal expert who knows lawyers' tricks to work out what happened and discerning the verdict. Did this person do this thing or not? And then there's sentencing, which is uh, how does the community feel? You know, what does the community feel should happen to the person who did this? And we've got to, we've got to ask backwards. And I remember thinking, why is the jury, who are not legal experts, why are they in charge of the verdict, like discerning what happened? And then the judge who's not a member of the community, he's a bureaucrat, decides the verdict. That doesn't make any sense to me. It should be the other way mm. around. This would be The judge sits there and hears the case and goes, okay, yeah, but you've, I know you lawyers and your tricks. I'm not going to fall for that. I'm not going to fall for that. You know what? On the on the balance of probability, beyond reasonable doubt, I'm going to say you you did this thing. Okay, jury, you've heard the case. What would, what should happen to this person? Mm-hmm. But then I realised that's, that's too empowering for the commoners. That is way too empowering because the judge could say, yes, you did this thing. But then the jury might say, yeah, but, you know, we kind of get why he would do that. And it's, you know, the state was the victim. It wasn't like it was a person. It was, you know what? Yeah, we're just going to give him time served. And, they, and then the, the fear of getting locked up goes away. So what they did was they said, well, we're going to keep this idea of a jury of your peers keeping you safe against the state. But what we're going to do is we're going to completely, um, we're going to completely disempower them. We're going to basically say, uh, if 
uh, you know, your job is just to decide whether this guy did this or not, not to decide what should happen. Just you need to work out whether he did it or not. And then, of course, there's all tricks and games and uniforms that they play to, you know, really impress mm-hmm. on the jury that you kind of need to find this guy guilty. And and then the judge gets to decide whatever whatever sentence. And I remember thinking the only reason we've got this ass backwards, the only possible reason to have this ass backwards is if the state is pretending to empower the common man, but is actually wanting to be scary and retain all the power itself and that was one of many things that kind of fell into place when i started thinking along those lines um so yeah i guess we've each got our own journey but I, yeah i really want to talk to you again because I, I find it fascinating how um how recent and fresh this is for you and what other things might start making sense to you the, you know the more you think it through and the more you think mm-hmm. hang on why why does this work that way why does that work that way and things that were always just oh that'll just be a mystery to me forever suddenly you re- revisit it with this fresh mind, you know, um, uh, the renewing of your mind, so to speak, and everything makes a, a whole lot more sense. And, and and those things, those final pieces of the puzzle start snapping into place. So, yeah, it's fascinating. And I really kind of, <laughs> part of me envies you the, the the fact that you're at the start of this journey, uh, not to say yeah. I'm anywhere near the end, but uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's great. It's yeah, great. I don't really envy anybody too, that's been in it for as long as they have because they're, I mean, I'm 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 praying I'm in it at a at a time where like the majority of us have to be awake in order to make the transition that's necessary. Um yeah. because ah, God, if I like, there's a lot of people I talk to that have just known the world is the way that it is for like 20 plus years. You know what I mean? And and I just I couldn't imagine knowing and watching everything go down for the last 20 some years, progressing further to the end goal, you know. Like I couldn't, I, think, I couldn't imagine. I think it's, you might find it's not a coincidence that this has happened around the time of parenthood because you now look at the world as, okay, I need to get this right. My parents didn't, they were just NPCs, but I need to get this right for my kids. I can't afford the luxury of ignorance anymore. I need to make better sense of the world. Yeah, that's, I'm, it's, yeah, a hundred percent. And, 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 and again, it's, it's not their fault. Like that's, that's part of like, they were also part of the system, you know, like they're, I remember, I, re- I remember my dad saying once, it was like, it was like, how come, you know, I was like, how come we have to vote for Obama? And, and, and he was like, if, you know, if we vote the other way, then, you know, we'll lose our insurance and we won't be able to like afford anything. And it was like, it was because we were in the poverty cycle, you know, at the end of the day, like we were heavily under government support. And, you know, in hindsight, looking at that, like, I now know what control mechanisms those are. I know what that I know what that meant. I know what that fear of, you know, like relying on the government for your kids' well-being, like and not being able to do without, but then also being trapped enough to not be able to see that, like, you're pissing away like five dollars a day on cigarettes, you know. You don't need that soda every single day. Like these are these are part of the mechanisms that are like keeping you in place. You know, like you're right. We can't afford this. You have five kids. We have low income and like, sure, but you're not making decisions that are outside of instant gratification, you know, vices and mechanisms and stuff along those lines. Um and so it's like, you know, looking at that, but these were all things that were put in place specifically to keep the people in this way, you know, like they're, they're all designed to do this, you know, um, going all the way back to the, the, the two, you know, the two working adults, like that was, I mean, I, I had no idea. I had no idea until I got kids. I remember like coming out of high school, assuming and basically like that if any woman wanted to stay at home and raise kids she was a gold digger you know and that my soulmate my wife had to be like a working woman you know she had to pull her own weight and we were going to do all this stuff together and that is literally like i mean that was like my wife's narrative too you know for the most part like she ended up going off to college you know got two degrees and you know came off into the working force with me and then but once we got to that crossroads of like, here's our first kid and she's literally staring at her child. That's when she was met with this, this decision that no, you could, you, you can't tell a young girl 
that, hey, there's probably going to be a day when you're going to be staring at your child and you might not want to do anything else other than be with that child and to raise that child. You know what I mean? And then what? Then she's got to look behind her and see that she pissed away sixty, seventy thousand dollars for fucking degrees at a university that we all had to go get. You know, we couldn't be successful if we didn't go off to college, you know, and both guys and girls had to do it. You know what I mean? And then plus we're like 20 something at that point because we pissed away five years of our youth in school still. So, like, now we're further along. She's further along in, like, her fertility and everything. Her timeline's crunched. And now she's she's a debt or she, she's a slave to the, to the system because she can't afford to be a stay-at-home mom. Not talking about my wife specifically. We are very blessed. We made the decision and trusted God to go to single income, and we are doing it so far so good uh since covid she hasn't she hasn't but like that's not that's not because you know the system like we didn't make those choices when we were in high school we made all the choices that the state wanted us to do to make that choice damn near impossible you know and like then you get to the point where other people are just raising your kids and right now the other people that are employed to raise your kids are not they don't have your best your kid's best interest in mind, you know, you get into the same system that you're in, you know, with, you know, schools and standard curriculums and all that We're regurgitation, just getting, mm, it's just getting further and further away from, you know, like creativity and, you know, uh, you know, skills like independent skills, not like a, a, a foundation of like basic skills that everyone has to have, you know, create um, wage slaves. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's a it, it's a very I, I don't fault my parents. I do not fault my parents at all. And um, I just can see I can see the mechanisms that were in place for us. Well, and you can also you can also see how readily you'd fall into that trap yourself if you didn't have the Internet. Right. These people grew up without the Internet. So they had no easy means of communicating with like finding and communicating with like-minded mm -hmm. people we sit here now and say well i went down this rabbit hole and that rabbit hole and i was on youtube for eight hours one night and i just completely blew my mind or you know bitcoin yep. i barely slept for three or four days when i first read about bitcoin i just voraciously destroying this you know uh, trying to trying to d digest it yeah they didn't have that right they, they might find you might find a magazine on a bench that was a you know conspiracy theory magazine or something but there's no there's no yeah. feedback mechanisms there's no communication there so now we sit here in judgment of these people saying oh you you know how dare you you know no, not be at my level it's like no you how did they how could they have been expected to yeah um yeah 100 percent. and our grandparents well a lot of them came from war times right they only wanted to survive that's all they didn't have any like, oh, let's think about, you know, like all these other things. It was just about let's get out of where we are. Let's go to another country and make the most of it. Mm -hmm. And they taught their parents, our parents, that as well. Right. So that's why they're so just they don't have time for that. They just work workhorses or they just want to, you know what I mean? And here we are. We have luxury to think and to analyze, to observe. And how wrong that all is and how that was created by those harsh times, those resets, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, looks like we're bound for another one soon, huh? You know? Yep. You can't get a people free thinking for themselves because then they look at it and go, oh, that's wrong. That's just, that's just not right. I don't want to get in debt. You know, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. Everything that I've been told, it just seems like one big lie to me. You know, and uh, uh, that's happening now, especially with the young ones on TikTok. They get bite-sized pieces of people showing all this, you know? Mm -hmm. it's, it's quite If they're looking dangerous. in the right places, you know, because yes. TikTok is also, you know, definitely one of those mechanisms yeah. that is not helping in a lot of areas, it's not. you know? It's not. But, but, but yeah, yeah if, you're, if, if, if somebody's kind of nudged in the right direction, then yeah. But... Boba Fett, I'm. I apologize. My wife's peeking around at the corner of me. I have to go. I have to uh, go ahead and get back with my kids and help End out. End of an but... episode, man. 
I'm yeah, definitely really for sure. Really appreciate you coming on, man. Anyway, so yeah. was yeah. Really? it really? Yeah. 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 quite well. Yeah. And the yeah. second half awesome. was just flown by. Um, yeah. Yeah, we definitely Matt, need a part two. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, as Matt said earlier, we'd love to get you back on, and mm. now we, we don't, don't even have time. I was looking at the clock at ten minutes, thinking, "Oh, we're not going to get any battles in on this episode," <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, we'd love to have you back. Um, yep, we can no work problem. work that out. Um, and this, this time, like fifteen hour time difference, is uh, if we can get this to work, which we did, we can do anything. So, look, thanks mm-hmm. for coming on. Thanks, do you have mate. any final words, wrap ups? Do you want to? pimp any channels or um, <laughs> guilds or anything like that? Uh, I mean, yeah, just uh, if you're interested in YGGSPL, make sure you kind of DM me or reach out to me on any of the discords. I'm in all of them. Uh, but yeah, come by uh, Splinterlands TV Monday nights, 9 p.m. Eastern to 11 p.m. Eastern and Saturday mornings, 6 a.m. Eastern to 7. And we'll hang out. But yeah, it was a pleasure to meet you guys and to talk with you guys. And uh, you guys are good people. This is the beautiful part about our uh, decentralized community is uh, I now Absolutely. have friends from way over, way over yonder. Yeah. The great down under. <laughs> so thanks for joining us on 84. We will see you on 85. Please like, comment, subscribe, all that stuff. I'm Boba Fett. Peace out.